Hello and welcome back for this second episode of uh, workshops on the Barcello Suites on iDagio Live. Today I would like to start with a follow-up because um, you all uh, had sent me very very interesting questions over social media uh, before the last, before the premiere, the first episode and what happened is that I spoke too much, I got carried away and then at the end with Anne Teresa the Kersmaker we also spoke and spoke and then there was no time to go at this question. So before we go to the subject of the day, which is the Allemande from the first suite, I would like to do a follow-up and a finish with two questions um, that came to me before the last episode about specifically the prelude of the first suite. And there was one question by Heather Mosley, and the question was talking about the prelude of the first suite. The harmony moves pretty slow. It feels a la breve, but is still written in four. How do you reconcile that? Ideas on tempo would be interesting. So, um, about this first question, uh, first question, which is a very interesting one, and I think in future episodes we will have more opportunity also to develop, but here um, uh, I want to say that happens very often in many pieces of music and in these suites, that you have a pulse, which is obviously in four, but clearly a harmonic structure and also a pattern structure, like in this prelude, that suggests that it is in half bars. And I guess the only uh, decent answer I would like to give about this is that we need all of the above. So um, we do need to have um, the flow of the music, which is like the pattern goes, which is half bars, which is alla breve, as Heather put, puts it. Um, and we need the harmonies go bar by bar. So we will have some impulse that is repeating at the beginning of each bar. The next, the next impulse, and this is going to be a breathing that will go in bar by bar. And nevertheless, I think we need, particularly in a movement like this one that has an ostinato quality with all these 16th notes, to have a very loose but present underlying um, um, smaller value of rhythm. And to be honest, before I go on stage, very often for myself to be to be in the groove, to have this feeling, I play an imaginary battery of, of bass, which would go in, ha in, a, in a, um, uh, quavers, one would say, or, the, uh, or in eighth notes, which, which goes like this. So that you can feel one, two, three, four, one, two, so, as you see, I need to feel the downbeat, uh, because of the pattern I will feel the half bars, but I also like inside to feel this very light one, two, three, four. That was about the question of Heather Mosley. The other question was from Auguste Rachet. What does this prelude evoke to you? What is your vision of it? So, I had called the last episode uh, The Call of Nature because um, uh, everything in this suite and in this prelude more, in, more particularly evokes to me the flow, evokes something which is related to nature. As I mentioned last time, for me, I, I see in particular in the music of Bach, but probably in all Western music uh, over the last centuries, uh, harmony is the environment in which we evolve. It is the air we breathe. It is the water that flows, so it is the elements. And within this, then, the story will start. And 
uh, I think everything in this in this uh, evokes a flow, a Bach in German, Bechlein, a little river, um, and this is what it evokes to me. But it's really uh, because uh, August was asking this that I mention it because uh, I find it always dangerous. I don't want to impose my pictures to you. You might have a totally different picture of that. Uh, which would absolutely make sense. Uh, the last question I want to um, mention here, and then we go to the Allemande, was by Jeffrey Wang, and his question was more generally about the preludes. He said, the prelude is often, often thought of as the overview big picture of a suite. In terms of tempo choices, how much influence does the prelude have over the dances that follow. Uh, also very interesting question, thank you so much. Um, indeed, I think the prelude is the movement that again sets the stage of the story that is about to, to uh, unveil and that is about to be developed by the composer. Uh, which, is, which brings me to the Allemande. Um, maybe you saw that today's episode, I uh, undertitled it Allemande, the storyteller, because in my perception, I feel after um, giving the, the atmosphere, the character with the prelude, when I start the Allemande, I have the feeling that now in this, uh, in this case, in this G major uh, world in which we are, um, we start to speak, we start to tell a story, and Bach, um, in this case, uh, does it with a, with an incredibly uh, tender, varied uh, use of the line, very very free. Um, and and uh, yes, maybe before I go on into some passages that I want to catch your attention to. Um, I play it a little bit. again a lot of 16th note but remember in the prelude it was about patterns and something that seems to be like a natural phenomenon that rolls that repeats itself and here all the contrary we have we have a line that that goes uh, down up in scales in arpeggios but in a way which is never repeated even when and later on i will give an example when bach goes into a very normal sequence of fifths, uh, he, he does it with uh, seemingly, you know, do, repeating the motifs, but always varying them um, in, in greatest detail. In this first half, there are two, show, uh, two things I want to uh, catch your attention to. The first one is that just at the place where I had arrived, um, there is a succession of two little modulations uh, which are put together in a way to bring us to the key of D major which is going to be our uh, next key, the key where we will arrive at the middle of the piece. And both modulations, uh, I, would, I would refer to what I said uh, last time if you, if you were there, that uh, Bach doesn't let us hear uh, the key notes of these modulations until later in the line. So again, that's his way to play around with the fact that at the contrary of today's guest, um, hello Pierre Laurent, <laughs> who will come soon and, and talk to us, um, uh, um, not, being, not having a piano in my hands, I will not harmonize um, um, on actually where the modulation is taking place, but the harmony will, pre -pre will be presented in an ambiguous and very poetic way, a bit 
later. I will immediately show, show you this example. So, um, I, first I finished the presentation in G, in, uh, G major. And here comes my first modulation. So, this D sharp that I just played now at the end is the key note. This is the note that actually makes the modulation, that is determining for what's coming afterwards. Well, as you see, he presents it only on the third beat of the bar, even though actually, in fact, we know it's there on the downbeat. <laughs> I now did my modulation to E minor, playing little uh, the bass line. And what I want to point to again, and I will talk about this a few times, is that uh, it's not that Bach thought, oh well, bad luck, I'm composing for cello, so I cannot provide the whole thing, is that he, th he knows that by letting these important notes come later, he makes it even more subtle and poetic. Same modulation, the same. This time I will first play uh, with the bass notes that are not in the score. Uh, but what Bar composed. Here I could actually believe that I'm still in E minor. And then there is just en passant, like a, as if it would be a not important note, the C sharp, which is an, the key note for this modulation. Uh, and this is these are all things that give a very tender, a very special uh, um, um, color to this discourse. Uh, in the first part, the, all, the one other thing I wanted to mention is that the Allemand is a dance, and one could say, in this case, it's a dance between G major and D major, in love with each other and letting each other the way successively four times. So we go at the beginning of the piece from G major to D major, but instead of just doing it, after we have done our first modulation, four times in a row, we will go back to G major, go to D major, go back to G major, go to D major. And I will now uh, point that to you. So we have done our modulation. Uh, here I'm in D major. Hello G major. D major. Hello G major. It was a play between these two, uh, these two keys. It's it's so beautiful. Anyways, uh, in the second half, I want to catch your attention to uh, what I was mentioning before: a sequence that, after a few modulation, and we have an episode in A minor, and then we go to a sequence, which, as such, is something very almost one could say banal that all compos composers use. So this is a sequence, but uh, uh, Bach manages to make it the most uh, charming, the most poetic uh, thing in music, simply by 
always uh, by letting us play between the different voices that's the one thing and the other thing by varying always this 16th note it's never twice the same <laughs> I go down, I go up, and then I, I salute the bass. And I will dare now something which I never thought I would dare, knowing that Pierre Laurent Emma might be already listening and watching. I want to say that this passage, this in a way harmonically very simple music, and I, as I was preparing for this, I was thinking, why this very simple music, why does it touch me so much? Why, why is it one of the key passages in, the, in this Allemande? And it reminded me of a passage in um, the fourth sonata by Beethoven for cello and piano. In the second movement, in the slow part, after a very dark episode where the cello plays in octaves, in a very so, sorry for the tuning of the piano i didn't have a tuner since the end of confinement yet but we arrive after this very dark episode here and then suddenly the piano leaves the room uh, leaves the place for the cello and the cello starts a lead mm -hmm. For me, one of the most moving moments in this sonata and in the cello repertoire, and, and yet harmonically, it's, it's, there is nothing more simple. And I find very impressive when a composer like Bach in this passage or like Beethoven here suddenly goes with uh, utmost humility to something very simple and uh, touches our heart. Uh, that way. Uh, I hope this time, yes, this time I managed not to be all too long. Um, so, and now we will go to our um, uh, moment where uh, the, of the guest of the day. And, you, okay, I am afraid to use always superlatives, but um, because last time when it was Anne Teresa, the caresmaker, I, I said uh, how much it means to me to have Anne Teresa on the first show. Uh, unfortunately, I do have to use superlatives again when it's, it comes to Pierre Laurent Emma. Um, not only because could, he's however, the immense not. artist that he is. Ah. You could, however, not. Well, uh, Pierre you Laurent, could don't... To the music. Okay, okay, okay. I, I just want to say, uh, then, without using superlatives, just to say that uh, when I came to the Ensemble Intercontemporain, I was 23 years old, and at that time, you were still in the Ensemble, not for very long anymore, but that's where we met in this context of uh, having the extraordinary um, uh, privilege to work on a daily basis with living composers. Um, and, and, and to, you, we then uh, shared some uh, uh, teaching experience because you um, asked me to be your assistant for the chamber music class in, in Paris. And um, I unfortunately have to say that you have been one of the most inspiring uh, uh, persons in my life. So this is said. Now let's go to the music. Um, uh, uh, Pierre Laurent, what, um, first of all, as I told you before, go on whatever subject you want, if possible, concerning the bar suites. But uh, my question, which, which I would find interesting, uh, because as a, as a uh, playing a keyboard instrument, you have such an opulent uh, repertoire in general but in Bach in particular, and with these fugues and these things and, and, and all this. And we have just this little jewel. Um, uh, how, how do you perceive it? What is your, your uh, regard on the cello suites? Well, uh, maybe like with every 
series of pieces that he does, uh, and we have several of them, the feeling to be in front of a, a kind of summary uh, of, uh, of musical knowledge, of expressions of humanity. That means, you know, the, uh, this way he has to bring the universe to his piece, or to, or to englobe the universe. So in fact, in a set of pieces with a very strong order, very defined strong frame, this capacity to bring such variety that is breathtaking really. And then, um, because this is the way I think how he proceeds, he doesn't start from the instrument like an instrument, instrumentalist composing. He's really a visionary composer. So he brings things together and puts them work together. He composes really. So for him, the instrument is just a tool and he's constantly going beyond the borders of this tool. And this is fascinating that um, your instrument is not just a melodic instrument. It's also a harmonic instrument. It's also a polyphonic instrument. It's an orchestral instrument. Um, he is both respecting the instrument and taking the best of it and opening it completely. I mean, the, the fact to have a scordatura uh, for the fifth suite and then the five uh, strings of the uh, um, uh, uh, viola composa for the sixth one shows that uh, the borders, the instrumental borders, what is given to him is never enough. And that I find uh, overwhelming that though respecting and taking best, making the greatest achievement of an instrument, this instrument is just a, a, a key to open a, a door for the entire world. You just framed it so perfectly. <laughs> so I'm, I'm almost speechless. Is there now... Uh, <laughs> is there... Um, in the six suite now, a more general question, but do you, um, is there a, a suite that has sort of played an important role at some moment in your life that you have listened to it a lot? Uh, your, your sister is a cellist, so you for sure heard this suite a lot in your life. Um, but uh, is there, is, did one of the suites uh, play um, I don't know, has, has, is there one that is that speaks even more to you? Uh, like, I don't know about the cellists out there, but in my experience, it's by phases. So there are some moments in my life where I suddenly feel totally en phase with a certain, a certain suite. Um, I don't know. I find, of course, the two last have exceptional dimensions. And in some of the dances, he develops his project uh, beyond any expectation. Uh, of course, the fifth one is overwhelming in terms of expression and depth. But I think I love, especially, I'm very fascinated by the, the D major, the, the, the sixth one, uh, maybe because of this challenge of uh, um, an instrument that opens um, the possibility of his prolific developments, yes, of this permanent, this world in permanent expansion, so to say. Um, so uh, the level of playfulness of the prelude, when he uses all these cells and make this kind of urge of having them developing the, the, the space and the texture of, of the instrument is just irresistible, of course. And then the, the endless um, melodic imagination of the Allemands uh, that is just um, letting us discover what a melody can be in terms of fantasy. Uh, of course, the, the simplicity of the gavots and the well, the the, the close closeness to earth of the second one with the bourdon uh, at the end. 
So all these dimensions, and for me, maybe the most breathtaking, what is the, this from the Sarabande? I think this, if, to answer your question, the Sarabande are the parts of the suite I prefer above all. But in this case, this gesture to put in the center of such an expansive uh, piece, a piece that is the most sober, you can believe, and the most unexpected to compose for your instrument, a quarrel. What is by essence a collective piece that has nothing to do with a solo string instrument. Mm -hmm. And the most condensed a quarrel on earth, uh, uh, the most perfect, the most dense also, so that everything can be sage, everything essential in music with such a, a, a simple form, but the most unexpected for your instrument. So that suddenly the, 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 the well, if we call it a cello, well, that's the wrong <laughs> uh, word certainly, but becomes the most harmonic and the most polyphonic instrument on earth. That I find really, <laughs> Uh, uh, the genius of uh, unexpected creation by Bach, especially in such a varied suite uh, um, where you deal with completely dim different imagination of, uh, of human, uh, of human vision. So. I would have one last question about the only fugue by Bach that we have uh, in the in the prelude of the fifth suite, which uh, which you also mentioned that as one of your of your favorites, um, obviously because of the limitations of our instrument, um, it could seem in comparison um, with uh, your fugues, uh, with many of them, or even with the C major fugue for violin, which uh, where he goes much more, much further. Um, in again exploding the the limitations of the instrument. Uh, so our our fugue is is rather modest, uh, but nevertheless, I, maybe it's because it's the only one we have by Bach. But I love it so much, and uh, I wondered if you have um, uh, if you have, have you would say a word about how he deals in this particular uh, fugue with, with our limitations as cellist um, in a way that I personally find very, very compelling and poetic. Well, he doesn't take them as limitations, I think. Uh, so the, the polyphonic thought is so realized that the problem of the limitation doesn't come in question. By the way, when he transcribes, as one always did in these eras, um, a, a fugue for solo violin for organ, for instance, you don't lose, you don't gain anything in polyphony uh, because this culture is there so much. It's like when he composes harmonically for the cello, well, in the many of the Allemands, especially of the two last suites, the big, uh, most of the time, four notes chords that describe um, the, the, the harmonic structure somewhere are never felt like uh, limitations of the instrument. Uh, uh, and in the case of the, the, the preludes, for instance, from the first suite, you have showed it a lot of the fourth one when his um, arpeggio art uh, imagination is so um, marvelously designed and imaginative. Well, he does the same thing at, at the keyboard. It's not melodic music, it's really harmonic music and the harmony is described by an arpeggio, but the arpeggio is written on such um, a composed and inspired way that you, you follow the, the vertical structure all the time and you never think, my God, this instrument is supposed to play one or a little bit more notes at the same time. Uh, so it's, always the strength of the thought, of course, of the imagination of the creator uh, that is leading you. If he's good. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of it. What you said about transcriptions uh, re reminded me, I would like to mention, but of course, when we will come to the fifth suite um, in later episodes, I will talk more about this, but there is a transcription, there is a version of this fifth suite for lute. 
And it is so interesting to see how in this transcription he uh, changes, um, well, he first of all, he does ha uh, add a lot of, of, of bass notes that we don't play, even at places where it would be absolutely no problem to play them. So it, it really raises the question why he doesn't do it. And then the most absolutely um, um, crazy example is the final chord of the fugue, uh, which in the lute version uh, stays in minor, and in the cello version it's a, it's a brilliant Picard uh, uh, third. Um, it, 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 he ends with a, I mean, really like uh, nowadays, you know, with a, with a movie, uh, when you see, you know, great movies and then they give you the, the, the alternative ending, which ends totally in a different light. So it's uh, fascinating to see how he enjoys also giving a different meaning to the same material. But... Uh, I mean, you reuse a piece, then why not to change the places that will be more adapted to an instrument or a context? Or just follow your fantasies or your wish of um, making it better. Uh, we see that with the different copies of different pieces where there are osias, there are different versions of one or the other bar, and then you can yourself decide what seems uh, to you to be the best and why he decided uh, to make this potentially, well, different, if not better option. Mm -hmm. Or a, a better polyphonic um, um, organicity um, for... Um, um, well, uh, more, a more natural line or more interesting, more varied. I mean, there are always many reasons. Pierre Laurent, uh, merci, merci a million times for Wait. taking the time. <laughs> and um, uh, I say uh, goodbye to everybody. Thank you for following this. And I see you for the courant from the first suite on Saturday at seven o'clock and keep sending your questions and ideas. It's wonderful and it helps me very much to, to, to know what's important to you. So thank you everybody. Bye bye.